In a secret ballot Tuesday night, House Republicans chose their latest speaker nominee. The question here is, is, is Mike Johnson the right guy at the right time? And I think he is. Louisiana Congressman Mike Johnson securing 128 votes from the conference. I'm very confident. Johnson was first elected to Congress in 2016 and voted against certifying the 2020 presidential election. You're going to see a new form of government and we are going to move this quickly. He becomes the fourth Republican speaker nominee in three weeks and the second nominee of the day after Minnesota Congressman Tom Emmer dropped out of the race. In Indiana, I think there were maybe 28 or so that stated they're going to choose someone else other than Tom Emmer. Emmer's bid was doomed after former President Donald Trump slammed him on social media, calling him a rhino, Republican in name only. I think we need a Speaker of the House that reflects the views of Republican voters, and Republican voters largely support President Trump. The infighting leading to growing frustrations within the GOP. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing first and foremost to our party. As the House remains at a standstill. Just pick someone. With a government shutdown still looming. Chanel Call, CBS News, New York. I'm honored to have the support of my colleagues, and what they understand about this is this is servant leadership. We're going to serve the people of this country. We're going to restore their faith in this Congress, this institution of government. America is the last best hope of man on the earth. Abraham Lincoln said it, Ronald Reagan used to remind us all the time, and we're here to remind you of that again. We're going to restore your trust in what we do here. You're going to see a new form of government, and we are going to move this quickly. This group here is ready to govern, and we're going to govern well. We're going to do what's right by the people. And I believe the people are going to reward that next year. But we have a lot of big priorities ahead of us right now. The world is on fire. We stand with our ally, Israel. We have a very busy agenda. We have appropriations bills to get through the process, but you are going to see this group looking, working like a well-oiled machine. We owe that to the American people. The, the people up here are, have been sent here by the people of this country to do this job, and we are going to do it well. We commit that to you. Thank you for allowing us to go through the process and get to this. It was worth it, and we are going to serve you well. The intention is to go to the House floor tomorrow and make this official, and so we will be doing that. And, uh, if there are any questions, we'll take a couple, but we're all pretty weird. <laughs> What's that? The intention is to go at noon tomorrow. All of us. All of us. Yeah, we have some folks absent, and, and we'll be, I'll be working with them tonight. So. I, I don't know what the it was. We're united. We're united. There, there were no votes again. Here we go again. The House is expected soon to hold a fourth vote now to elect its next speaker. Now, this comes more than three weeks after Congressman Kevin McCarthy was ousted from the rule. Lawmakers are congregating on the House floor now. Nominating speeches are expected to begin at any moment. Louisiana Congressman Mike Johnson won the Republican nomination for House Speaker last night. He is the fourth spe speaker designate selected by the GOP conference, and he won the nomination just hours after House Majority Whip Tom Emmer dropped out of the race. Now, just minutes ago, Congressman Johnson expressed his confidence that he will, in fact, be elected speaker. I think we'll be unified today. I'm excited you about it. I do. I do. On the first vote? On the first vote. There you go. He's going to get it on the first vote, so says he. CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian joins us now from Capitol Hill. Nicole, we've all been here before, and I empathize with you answering this next question, but how can we expect this fourth vote for the House Speaker to unfold? 
Well, you know, I'm not going to begin to predict just because this has been such a tumultuous process. But as you heard from Speaker Designate Mike Johnson, he is hopeful that he can get the votes he needs on this first ballot. Uh, last night, of course, he won 128 votes in a secret ballot, but there were a number of lawmakers who were absent. There were also about 30 lawmakers who voted for other candidates. Uh, but that being said, last night he said he was confident, he feels confident uh, going into this round. One reason why is that he really hasn't been facing as much pushback as we have seen other candidates receive, whether that was Jim Jordan, where there was just a firm block in opposition to him, uh, similar with uh, Steve Scalise. Uh, so from that standpoint, of course, Tom Member didn't even make it uh, to a floor vote yesterday, being only the speaker designate for about four hours. So uh, that being said, uh, you know, those potential holdouts seem to be a bit quieter. But because there were a number of lawmakers who weren't present at yesterday's meeting, it's still an unknown whether or not he will be able to lock this all down, get those 217 votes he needs on this first round. And Nicole, I want to follow up with you on your point about Tom Emmer. Like House Majority Leader Steve Scalise, how the House major Majority Whip dropped out of the race just hours after winning the GOP nomination for Speaker. Talk to us about what is happening there in the Republican conference. Yeah, well, this uh, was kind of a quick turn of events with respect to the Republican whip. I mean, he also similarly in a secret ballot won the support of his conference. He got just over about 100 votes. But as you know, to go to the floor, any candidate is going to need to lock down that magic number of 217. And so uh, once he secured that nominee status, he called for a roll call vote inside of that closed door meeting. In fact, they held a couple of rounds and continuously he was unable to build up more support. There were about 10 to 20 holdouts that we were aware of that simply uh, didn't seem willing to budge in terms of their support. Emmer did meet with them pretty extensively, tried to hear members out, kind of held this town hall style forum to try to air out people's concerns and grievances. Uh, but ultimately it wasn't enough to move them and then add to the fact that you had the former president who put out a truth social post criticizing Emmer, calling him a rhino, also uh, saying that he would be a tragic mistake if he were selected and then shortly thereafter that's where we saw Emmer uh, drop out, although he later told reporters he, he kind of deflected when asked whether uh, that Trump post was a factor. He just said that, you know, he was kind of responding to the will of the conference and believes the process should go forward. All right. Well, at the very least, we've all had great practice for this by now. Nicole <laughs> Killian, we'll see you again very soon. Well, we are taking you now back to Capitol Hill. You can hear or see rather that the nomination nomination speeches are about to begin. This is the fourth vote to elect the next speaker. Uh, let's go ahead and listen uh, in as as Republicans put forth their nominee. And as is expected, Democrats will do the same. This esteemed body today at a time of great crisis across America, a time of unprecedented challenges in this hallowed chamber, and a time when our most precious ally Israel's very existence is under attack from forces of evil. House Republicans and Speaker Mike Johnson will never give up. Today is the day we get this done. May God bless our next Speaker Mike Johnson. May God bless the United States of America. And I yield back. The reading clerk will now call the roll. Adams. Jeffries. Adderholt. All right, so everything is lined up then for him to take the Jeffries. gavel to be sworn in if, in fact, he reaches just 10 more votes in favor. Oh, nope, nine more votes in favor of Wagner. him. We expect Mike Johnson, Johnson then to become the next Speaker of the House momentarily. And what is remarkably different from this Johnson. vote compared to the previous votes we Waltz. watched last week 
is that Republicans came Johnson. into the room with enthusiasm. They seemed much more Wasserman unified Schultz. during their speeches. Um, we Jeffrey. saw Elise Stefanik um, nominate uh, Johnson, and, and we just heard a raucous round of applause. We see no defections. Jeffrey. The last few votes that we all watched happen live. I think Watson you had got like five or ten at some point. More each round for Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio. And now Mike Johnson uh, really within striking distance of the Speaker's gavel. Um, here in just a few moments. Yes, uh, we have seen occasional an occasional smattering of applause. Sometimes, you know, some of these representatives, as they stand up to cast their vote, will also throw in um, something more enthusiastic or more disparaging, uh, perhaps, for the other side. But um, I thought it was particularly interesting, Errol, the point that Scott made, which, you know, he cautioned, you can't read too much into it, but at every other vote, the Republicans and Democrats have made sure that they had every single member in attendance. Today, yeah. there are some Democrats that didn't, that are not in attendance. There's at least one Republican who's on a fact-finding trip to Israel at this moment. So it seemed like they, there was a consensus, at least within the halls of Congress, that this is it. This is going to be the election um, that is needed to finally put an end to this ongoing question, at least for the last 22 days, of who would lead the U.S. House of Representatives. That's right. The American public hasn't had their business in Congress done because of this issue. Mike Johnson now with 210 votes. Uh, just a few votes Western. away from becoming the next House Speaker. And you're right in that sometimes when Congress folks get up to give Jeffries. their vote, they say a little uh, speech, a little commentary. Why don't we quickly listen in and see if Jeffries. anything special is said as Mike Johnson crosses that important threshold of, of 215. Jeffries. Williams of New York. The son of a Mike Johnson. Johnson. Williams of Texas, Mike Johnson. Johnson, Wilson of Florida, Wilson of Florida, Jeffries, Wilson of South Carolina, Johnson, Whitman, Johnson, Womack, And you hear that applause. Mike Johnson has crossed that threshold to become the next House Speaker. And, it's and not you see just him there nodding and receiving the applause of his fellow Republicans. And it's not just massive applause. I mean, you might also hear the, the sigh of relief. <laughs> Audible sigh right? of relief. From Republicans yeah. now that they have been unified Johnson. and elected Mike Johnson from Louisiana as the next Speaker of the House after a tumultuous number of weeks. Now, each additional Republican getting more enthusiastic as they um, throw their votes his way. But he now, after the euphoria subsides, he has quite a lot of work to do. Um, I think it's only his fourth term. He's had experience raising millions of dollars, but we'll need to do much more than that in this role. We now will share the CBS News special report with you. This is a CBS News special report. I'm Major Garrett in Washington. We're coming on the air with breaking news. The House of Representatives has, after three weeks of legislative paralysis, elected a new speaker of the House of Representatives. His name, Mike Johnson of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Representative Johnson has secured the votes needed for victory. This happened just moments ago. He will replace Kevin McCarthy, who was removed as speaker three weeks ago after being targeted by Florida Republican Matt Gates and others in the Republican conference. Johnson, age 51, became the Republicans' Correa. fourth nominee for the speaker late last night after Tom Emmer of Minnesota Correa. withdrew after opposition from right-wing Republicans influenced by former President Donald Trump. Gallego. One of the reasons that that opposition arose to Emmer was he voted to certify the 2020 election. Representative Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan also withdrew in recent days in their bids to become speaker because they could not secure enough votes 
to win in the House Republican Thank Conference. Congressional correspondent Scott McFarlane is on Capitol Hill. Scott, history may record this as the consensus of the exhausted. Republicans have been through this over and over and over again, and now they've landed on a new speaker. What can you tell our audience about Mike Johnson of the 4th District of Louisiana? He's in his fourth term, a former talk radio host, a lower-ranking member of House Republican leadership. And as of 24 hours ago, not even a top vote-getter inside his own Republican conference to be the nominee. Mike Johnson, as you said, also voted to decertify the 2020 election won by Joe Biden. The person who was the nominee as of this time yesterday, Tom Emmer, voted to certify that election. But the conference has pivoted to Mike Johnson, who just ran the table inside a fractious Republican conference, which right now has been defined by bad blood amassed over the past three weeks. You watched history. This has never happened before. A speaker has never been voted out by his own party. That's what happened three weeks ago with Kevin McCarthy. And you saw them come together on a series of nominees between then and now. Steve Scalise, the majority leader, tried it, didn't get the votes. Jim Jordan, the judiciary chair from Ohio, went to the floor three times, couldn't get the votes. Tom Emmer had the nomination for four hours and bailed out, couldn't get the votes. Mike Johnson just now got the necessary votes, swept his own party. This typically happens so once every two years, Major. It's happened nearly 20 times this year, and it has concluded. We'll give you our audience a little bit more on Mike Johnson of Louisiana. Let's look at some of the aspects of his most recent voting record. You can see there he voted against, as Scott McFarland just said, certifying the 2020 presidential election. He voted against legalizing same-sex marriage. He voted against a Ukraine aid package in May of this year, opposed the most recent continuing resolution in September to keep the government opening, and he was part of the legal team that defended former President Trump in the first impeachment hearing and trial in the Senate about issues related to Ukraine. I want to bring in CBS News chief election and campaign correspondent Robert Costa. Robert, he, that is to say, Mike Johnson has never been a committee chairman. He's never been a subcommittee chairman. He is a backbencher for a House Republican conference that quite clearly and evidently wants a backbencher, someone who is less experienced than those who sought the position and could not secure the votes to hold it. That's exactly right, Major. And to really understand why Mike Johnson of Louisiana, this Republican most people in the country didn't know about a few minutes ago, is now Speaker of the House in the line of succession to the presidency. Let's look at a picture from last night of Congressman Johnson, now Speaker Johnson, surrounded by his colleagues, because he. this picture really tells you about why Johnson got this role. See, to behind Johnson is Elise Stefanik, the conference chair. You have Steve Scalise over his shoulder as well, the majority leader. They're the leadership, but who do you see tightly packed around him? The backbenchers, as Major Garrett just said. It's the backbenchers who elevated him. Those congressmen who and, and women who you don't know about, they're looking for someone to break up the leadership, someone new to come in, and someone who echoes former President Trump's politics in many ways. And this is someone who hosts a podcast, that where he talks about his Christian evangelical values with many members of Congress. He's well-known inside the House, not outside the House. And he's someone who's kept a low profile on television, but he's well-known as almost a conservative figure rising through the policy ranks in the House. So he has that foundation of relationships, even if he doesn't have the political capital, which is going to be very important, as you know, Major, facing him right now, real challenges, yes. how to fund support for Ukraine and Israel, as well as government funding. And just for our audience's benefit, Robert, you know this well. I want you to help them walk through this. He will be the speaker at the top, the apex of power in the House of Representatives. But all the other Republican superstructure remains. Steve Scalise will still be the majority leader. Tom Epper will still be the House majority whip. The chair appoints the Meaning those people who sought this position will now be beneath him, and they will have to offer their support, their guidance, their floor capabilities their legislative capabilities to this newly minted speaker. So he will be reliant, that is to say, Mike Johnson, on people he is just bested for this coveted position. And we will see if they can keep a united front, because you now have a new speaker who believes, certainly based on my conversations with his colleagues over the past 24 hours, that he does have power now, and he wants to use it. Speaker Johnson's already issuing his own letters about his agenda in terms of how he wants to handle appropriations. It's not necessarily the agenda of Majority Leader Scalise, though Scalise being from Louisiana as well and a mentor is certainly going to be 
a right hand to this new speaker. So will Tom Emmer, the majority whip. But what's going to be intriguing to watch and important for the country is how does he handle spending on all of these crucial fronts? This is someone who comes out of the House of Representatives flank that's anti-spending, that wants to restrict abortion rights, that wants to restrict the size of government. And this is someone who is not just kind of a conservative, he's a deep conservative on social issues, cultural issues, economic issues. So you have right now in the United States someone with an ideology from the right wing of the Republican Party assuming the speakership of the House. Republicans have described this three-week period as chaotic, a bad look, and now they have a speaker, which means they are a legislatively re-energized body, which means they can now engage with the White House. So I want to go to our senior White House correspondent, Weijia Jang, who joins us. Weijia, what's the perspective on this development from the White House? Well, Major, the White House and President Biden have been very careful not to talk about any potential candidates who may become the Speaker of the House, because that wouldn't be in the president's best interest, because he has to work with whoever it is. And in this case, it will be a bit awkward, because as you've been talking about, Congressman Johnson led the charge in the efforts to try to overturn the election that Joe Biden won back in 2020. But they have talked about the urgent need to fill this void because uh, right now President Biden is at the center of the world when it comes to the U.S. foreign policy. And he has been trying to convey that America is back, that allies can count on America, and that America is a leader for all democracies. But at the same time, you have this split screen of the dysfunction of Congress. And it's really fitting and really pretty remarkable timing, Major, that he's actually starting a press conference at this moment with the Prime Minister of Australia, who is here to talk about the security challenges in the Indo-Pacific. And so that prime minister has goals, too, uh, namely to get a, a submarine transfer that requires congressional approval. So all of this major to say that, yes, this is a requirement for the president to move his legislative agenda forward. So there will be relief here at the White House that the Republicans were able to elect someone, even if it is not uh, whoever the president was hoping it would be, although he never publicly said one way or another, Major in their tallies that the total number of votes cast is 429, of which the Honorable Mike Johnson of the state of Louisiana has re received 220 votes. And the Honorable Hakeem Jeffries of the State of New York has received 209 votes. Therefore, the Honorable Mike Johnson of the State of Louisiana, having received a majority of the votes cast, is duly elected Speaker of the House of Representatives for the 118th Congress. I think we're going to jump back yeah. now Over to, to uh, the, the House, Capitol. where our new House Speaker, Mike Johnson, is speaking. I want to, I want to uh, express my great thanks for our Speaker Emeritus, Kevin McCarthy. Kevin has dedicated over two decades of his life to selfless public service, 16 of those years in this house. And you would be hard pressed to find anybody who loves this institution more or has contributed more to it. He is the reason we're in this majority today. His impact can never be overstated, and I, I want to thank him for his leadership, 
his friendship and the, the selfless sacrifice that you and Judy have made for so many years. You, you helped build it, Kevin, and we owe you a great debt of gratitude. I want to thank the dedicated and overworked staff of this beleaguered house. They accept praise so stoically. But, <laughs> but Miss, Miss Susan Cole, our house reading clerk, and yes, yes. Listen, all the clerks and all the staff, you know, they're terribly overworked. This has been a grueling process, but they have served an integral role in keeping our republic, and we thank them for that service. I know we all do. I want to thank my dedicated wife of almost 25 years, Kelly. She's not here. We couldn't get a flight in time. This happened sort of suddenly. <laughs> but, but we're going to celebrate uh, soon. She spent the last... Uh, couple of weeks on her knees in prayer to the Lord, and um, she's a little worn out. We all are. I want to thank our children, Michael and Hannah and Abby and Jack and Will. All of our children sacrifice. All of them do, and we know that. And um, there's not a lot of perks to being a, a member of Congress's kid, right? And so I want to thank all of your families as well for what they endure and what they've had to endure for the last few weeks. We've been here a while. Uh, yeah. I want to thank my faithful mother, Jeannie Johnson, who bore me at the age of 17, and uh, my brothers Chris and Josh, and my sister Laura, and all their families, and all of our extended family. In Louisiana, family's a big deal, and we got a bunch of them. Uh, I especially want to thank all the extraordinary people of the great state of Louisiana. We have never had a Speaker of the House hail from our state, and so they've been lifting us up. Uh, I, I thank the, the people of Louisiana for the opportunity to serve you in Congress, and I am humbled by your continuous support. We will make you proud. To my colleagues, I, I want to thank you all for the trust that you have instilled in me to lead us in this historic and unprecedented moment that we're in. The challenge before us is great, but the time for action is now, and I will not let you down. I want to say to the American people, on behalf of all of us here, we hear you. We know the challenges you're facing. We, we know that, uh, that there's a lot going on in our country, domestically and abroad, and we are ready to get to work again to solve those problems, and we will. Our mission here is to serve you well, to restore the people's faith in this house, in this great and essential institution. My, my dad, it was mentioned my dad was a firefighter. He was an assistant chief uh, the fire department in my hometown of Shreveport, Louisiana, a little town in northwest Louisiana. On September 17, 1984, when I was 12 years old, he was critically uh, burned and permanently disabled in the line of duty. All I ever wanted to be when I grew up was the chief of the fire department in Shreveport. Um, but after the explosion on that fateful day, he nearly died, and it was a long road back, and it changed all of our life trajectories. I'm the oldest of four kids. And, and my dad, um, he lived with pain all the rest of his life, for decades more. And I lost my dad to cancer three days before I got elected to Congress, three days. And he wanted to be there um, at my election night so badly. Um, I'm the first college graduate in my family. This was a big deal to him. And um, so it was several weeks after that, it was early 2017, 2017, uh, it was my freshman term, and, and um, it, it fell to me to be in the rostrum one night to serve here as Speaker Pro Tem. I thought that was a big deal until I figured out that's what you do for freshmen late at night. <laughs> and I, I want to, I think if my memory serves, Miss Jackson Lee was, um, was winding down one of her long, eloquent speeches. <laughs> and not, not that I was not in, enraptured by her speech, but I, I looked, up, looked up at the top in, in uh, the chamber there, and I saw the face of Moses staring down. And um, I just felt in that moment the weight of this place, right? The, the history that is revered here and the future that we are called to forge. And I really was just kind of almost overwhelmed with emotion. It occurred to me in that moment, it had been several weeks and I had not had an opportunity yet to grieve my dad's passing and, and um, 
I just had this sense that, that somehow he knew. And, and I had tears come to my eyes, and I was standing here, and I'm wiping them away, and then it suddenly occurs to me, the late-night C-SPAN viewers are going to think something's very wrong with the new young congressman from Louisiana. It, it wasn't Sheila's speech. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I just knew in that moment that my, my, my dad, my father, would be, would be proud of me, and I felt that he was. And, and I think all of our parents are proud of what we're called to do here. I think all the American people at one time had great pride in this institution. But right now, um, that's in jeopardy. And we have a challenge before us right now to rebuild and restore that trust. Th this is a, a beautiful country. It's the beauty of America that allows a, a firefighter's kid like me to come here and serve in this sacred chamber where great men and women have served before all of us and strive together to build and then preserve what Lincoln did refer to as the last best hope of man on earth. We stand at a very dangerous time. I'm stating the obvious. We all know that. The world is in turmoil. But a strong America is good for the entire world. We, we are the beacon of freedom, and we must preserve this grand experiment in self-governance. It still is. We're only 247 years into this grand experiment. We don't know how long it will last, but we do know that the founders, to take, the founders told us to take good care of it. I want to tell all my colleagues here what I told the Republicans in that room last night. I don't believe there are any coincidences in a matter like this. I, I believe that Scripture, the Bible, is <clears throat> very clear. That, that God is the one that raises up those in authority. He raised up each of you, all of us. And, and I believe that God has ordained and allowed each one of us to be brought here for this specific moment in this time. This is my belief. I believe that each one of us has a huge responsibility today to use the gifts that God has given us to serve the extraordinary people of this great country, and they deserve it, and to ensure that our republic remains standing as the great beacon of light and hope and freedom in a world that desperately needs it. It was in 1962, in 1962, that, that our national motto, In God We Trust, was ad adorned above this rostrum. And if you look at the little uh, guide that they give uh, tourists and constituents who come and, and, and visit the house, if you turn in there to about page 14 in the middle of that guide, it tells you the history of this. And it says very simply, these words were placed here above us. This motto was placed here as a rebuke of the Cold War era philosophy of the Soviet Union. That philosophy was Marxism and communism, which begins with the premise that there is no God. This is a critical distinction that is also articulated in our nation's birth certificate. We know the language well, the famous second paragraph that we used to have children memorize in school, and, and they don't do that so often anymore, but they should. G.K. Chesterton was the famous British philosopher and statesman, and he said one time, America is the only nation in the world that is founded upon a creed. And he said it's listed with almost theological lucidity in the Declaration of Independence. What is our creed? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, not born equal, created equal. And they are endowed by the, the same inalienable rights, with the same inalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. That is the, that is the creed that has animated our nation since its founding, that has made us the great nation that we are. And we're in a time of extraordinary crisis right now. And the world needs us to be strong. They need us to remember our creed and our admonition. Turmoil and violence have rocked the Middle East and Eastern Europe. We all know it. And tensions continue to build in the Indo-Pacific. The country demands strong leadership of this body. And we must not waver. Our, our, our nation's greatest ally in the Middle East is under attack. The first bill that I'm going to bring to this floor in just a little while will be in support of our dear friend Israel, and we're overdue in getting that done. We're going to show not only Israel, but the entire world, that the barbarism of Hamas that we have all seen play out on our television screens is wretched and wrong, and we are going to stand 
for the good in that conflict. We, we have a catastrophe at our southern border. The Senate and the White House can no longer ignore the problem. From Texas to New York, wave after wave of illegal migrants are stressing our communities to their breaking points. We, we know that our streets are being flooded with fentanyl and all of our communities, children, and even adults are dying from it. The status quo is unacceptable, inaction is unacceptable, and we must come together and address the broken border. We have to do it. The skyrocketing cost of living is unsustainable and Americans should not have to worry about how they're gonna feed their family every week because they can't afford their groceries anymore. Everybody in this room should think about this. Here's the stats. Prices have increased over 17% in the last two years. Credit card interest rates are at the highest level in nearly three decades and mortgage rates are now at a peak we haven't seen since 2001. We have to bring relief to the American people by reining in federal spending and bringing down inflation. The, the greatest threat to our national security is our nation's debt. And while we've been sitting in this room, that's right, the, the debt has crossed almost $33.6 trillion. And the time that it's gonna take me to, to deliver this speech will go up another 20 million in debt. It's unsustainable. We have to get the country back on track. Now, we know this is not going to be an easy task, and tough decisions will have to be made. But the consequences, if we don't act now, are unbearable. We have a duty to the American people to explain this to them so they understand it well. And we are going to establish a bipartisan debt commission to begin working on this crisis immediately, immediately. <laughs> We all know that we also live in a time of bitter partisanship. It was noted, and it's been on display here today, right? When our people are losing their faith in government, when, when, when they're losing sight of the principles that made us the greatest nation in the history of the world, I think we gotta be mindful of that. We're gonna fight. We're gonna fight uh, vigorously over our core principles because they're at odds a lot of times now in this modern era. We have to sacrifice sometimes our preferences because that's what's necessary in a legislative body. But we will defend our core principles to the end. In his farewell address, thank you. In his farewell address, President uh, Reagan uh, explained the secret of his rapport with people. And, and I like to paraphrase his explanation all the time. He said, you know, they call me the great communicator, but I really wasn't that. He said, I was just communicating great things and they're the same great things that they've guided our nation since its founding. What are those great things? I call them the seven core principles of American conservatism, but let me concede to you all, I think it's really quintessentially the core principles of our nation. I boil them down to individual freedom, limited government, the rule of law, peace through strength, fiscal responsibility, free markets, and human dignity. Those, those are the foundations that made us the extraordinary nation that we are. And you and I today are the stewards of those principles, the things that have made us the freest, most powerful, most successful nation in the history of the world, the things that have made us truly exceptional. In this time of great crisis, it is our duty to work together, as previous generations of great leaders have, to face these great challenges and solve these great problems. I will conclude with this. The job of the Speaker of the House is to serve the whole body, and I will. But I've made a commitment to my colleagues here that this speaker's office is going to be known for decentralizing the power here. <laughs> my office is going to be known for members being more involved and having more influence in our processes and all the major decisions that are made here for predictable processes and regular order. We owe that to the people. That's right. And I want to make this commitment to you, to my colleagues here and on the other side of the aisle as well. 
My office is going to be known for trust and transparency and accountability, for good stewardship of the people's treasure, for the honesty and integrity that is incumbent upon us, all of us, here in the people's house. Our system of government is not a perfect system. It's got a lot of challenges, but it is still the best one in the world, and we have an opportunity to preserve it. Last thing I'm going to say is a message to the rest of the world. They have been watching this drama play out for a few weeks. We've learned a lot of lessons, but you know what? Through adversity, it makes you stronger. And yeah. And, and we want our allies around the world to know that this body of lawmakers is reporting again to our duty stations. Let the enemies of freedom around the world hear us loud and clear. The People's House is back in business. Thank you. Thank you. We will do our duty here. We will serve you well. We will govern well. And we'll make you proud in this institution again. We're going we're gonna to fight every day to make sure that is true. I look forward to the days ahead. I genuinely believe in my heart that the best days of America are still ahead of us. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm now ready to take the oath of office, and I ask the Dean of the House of Representatives, the Honorable Harold Rogers of Kentucky, to please administer the oath of office. Mr. Uh, Speaker designee, congratulations on your election. Thank you, sir. When our founding fathers chose a, a bold, new, and innovative uh, new self-rule government. It was met by deep uh, skepticism by the world's monarchs. Uh, they said self-rule is only a dream. Our founders said they're right. It's the American dream. Amen. Now it's, it's our dream. We're in charge. The speakership of the United States House of Representatives is the crucial outpost for the well-being of the people's government, the keeper, if you will, of the dream. Hmm. Sir, if you wish to assume this awesome responsibility, Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that you will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that you take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which you are about to enter. So help you, God. I do. So help me, God. Congratulations, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. And with that oath, it is now official. The new Speaker of the House, Louisiana Congressman Mike Johnson. Right before that, we heard in a speech rooted in faith and his history, uh, a speech from the new Speaker who thanked the last Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, for his leadership. And now, as Johnson marks uh, the first Speaker of the House from the uh, state of Louisiana, interestingly, Johnson says he knows that the challenges we're facing at home and abroad, and he looks forward to reestablishing faith in the institution.
of the House. And he also stressed in his speech the U.S. is, quote, a beacon of light and hope and freedom. That received a big applause. So he also said that uh, strong America is good for the entire world. You saw Democrats get up in the room and clap to that line as well. And he says the first bill that he will bring to the House floor is in support of Israel. Uh, Johnson also made a point that, quote, we must come together to address uh, the broken border. So there's a sampling of what's on his mind on his first day. CBS News congressional correspondent Scott McFarlane joins us now to speak about what comes next. Scott, based on what we just heard, what kind of leader can we expect Speaker Johnson to now become? He's going to have to learn a lot and quickly. He just went from a staff cubicle to the CEO's office. He has to now be the administrator of the entire U.S. House of Representatives and the leader of his party in the U.S. House. It's a big job, and he also has to develop a couple new skills, including raising money, millions of dollars in short order to help Republican candidates. He has no track record or muscle memory doing that. And he also has to be the dictator of the schedule and the policy priorities. He has no experience doing that for the Republican Party. His sign has already been added above the speaker's suite. It now says Speaker Mike Johnson. They put it up already. And he's about to make a walk down the hallways of the Capitol, likely to a press conference on the east steps of the Capitol to speak further about his initiatives and his plans. But yeah, we expected this when the uh, speaker vote concluded that the first order of business would be this formal resolution to denounce the attack on Israel. Members of Congress have been eager to pass that ever since the attack, but they've been stalled in doing so because of the stalemate over the speaker's gavel. That bipartisan moment you saw, the standing ovation from both sides for the new speaker may be the last bipartisan moment he gets to enjoy for quite some time here at the Capitol. Yeah, well, that said, though, Scott, uh, you know, Johnson really stayed away from some of the more contentious issues. Uh, it was a different speech than the, the nominating speech we heard from Congresswoman Stefanik. Um, and even then, when he was laying out the issues that he seeks to address, the first one being Israel and Hamas, uh, that war, we expect that there's going to be a widespread bipartisan agreement for a denunciation of uh, terrorist acts by Hamas. Um, but then other, other things that he articulated, uh, including the economy, announcing a bipartisan debt commission. Uh, were you surprised at all by the overtures that he made towards uh, trying to reunify and, and get the uh, both 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 parts of Congress working together, or do you think that that's just what you expect in this type of a speech? Yeah, it is tradition when the speaker gives his or her inaugural speech to hit the sweet spots, the areas that are not divisive. There's nobody who's going to object to having a debt commission. It's an old bromide of Washington, D.C. to put a blue ribbon panel together to look at a big problem, and certainly there is near universal support for immediate robust funding for Israel. Um, but the wedge issues are coming, and they're coming fast. Yeah. At some point, he's going to have to lay down a marker on where he stands and where the Republicans in the House stand on Ukraine funding. You recall President Biden last week requested $105 billion, not just for Israel, but for Ukraine, too. And that is a wedge issue. Inside the Republican conference, there are dozens of members who do not support that. That is now Mike Johnson's issue to deal with. How does he corral his Republicans on that issue? Do, do we and know, then, Scott? Oh, by the way, Sorry, do we know where he, where he falls on that? Uh, that it tends to be our first question <laughs> when we get uh, access to him today. Right. Uh, but he's going to have to speak for a broader constituency now. Yeah, he spoke for the Western uh, community of Louisiana, the, the most western part of that state. Now he represents not just that part of Louisiana, but the entirety of the U.S. House to a degree, and certainly the entire Republican conference. And pardon me as I keep an eye to the side for people coming from the House floor. But that issue is coming fast. I mean, ultimately, the president says that is emergency money needed as soon as possible. It's not something they can debate at length over the course of many months. That's coming down the pike. But so, too, Lana and Errol, is just how much to spend on everything the government is invested in. That's a wedge issue in his party. There are some Republicans who want to see robust federal spending on social safety net programs, on things like climate change initiatives, diversity initiatives. But then there are further right, more conservative members of this conference who want all those programs scaled back. That's now Mike Johnson's problem as well.
he is now the leader of his party in half of Congress. Keep in mind, Republicans don't have the White House, they don't have the Senate. He now is the highest ranking Republican in government. Yesterday, he was a backbench member of the U.S. House from Louisiana with no earthly idea he was about to become second in line to the presidency. And now, Scott, you see. He's got a lot to do in a short period of time. Apologies for the interruption, but you see, the new House Speaker has taken to the microphone. Let's listen. Serve the American people. Steve Scalise represents so much in our home state of Louisiana. Uh, one of the things he, he truly represents is perseverance and hope. And as he was talking here just a moment ago, I was reminded of the scripture that says suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. What we need in this country is more hope. The, the, the people have lost their faith in our institutions. The, 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 their faith is at an all-time low. And, and one of the reasons they've lost it is because the Congress, over the years, has not delivered for the American people well enough. We're in the majority right now. We've gone through a little bit of suffering. We've gone through a little bit of character building. And you know what it's produced? More strength, more perseverance, and a lot of hope. And that's what we're about to deliver to the American people. Yeah. We are going to speak, we're going to speak with clarity and conviction and consistency to the American people. We're going to tell them what we're for, what agenda we are pursuing, and why it is best for every American, why it will give them more liberty, opportunity, and security. We're going to speak to that clearly. We're going to act consistently, and we're going to exhibit two things here, trust and teamwork. And this group will deliver for the American people. I said it in the chamber, and I will say it here. We're going to govern well. And I think the people are going to be very pleased with those results. We're so grateful. I'm so grateful and so humbled to have gotten a unanimous vote on the floor by all of my colleagues here. Um, we, we went through a lot to get here, uh, but, but we are ready to govern. And that will begin right away. You've all heard me talk a lot today, and I'm not going to belabor the point because the sun is bright and it's too warm for the fall. <laughs> but I'll say this. We're going to dispense with all the usual ceremonies and celebrations that traditionally follow a new speakership because we have no time for either one. The American people's business is too urgent in this moment. The hour is late. The crisis is great. In America, we hear you. And we are reporting again, as I said in there, to our duty stations. That will begin in just a few moments. This entire group is going to go back to the House floor, and we are going to pass our resolution in support of the nation of Israel, our closest ally in the Middle East. You're going to see an aggressive schedule in the days and weeks ahead. You're going to see Congress working as hard as it's ever worked, and we are going to deliver for the American people. I'm grateful for this opportunity. I want to thank you for being patient with us, and I promise you it'll be worth it. Yeah. God bless you. God bless you. Short remarks there from the newly elected Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, again alluding to scripture and his faith, but saying that everyone in America will see an aggressive schedule by mm -hmm. Republicans ahead. Scott McFarlane, our congressional correspondent, listening into this as well. Scott, the honeymoon is over mm -hmm. and the work now uh, needs to be done. What happens next? I noticed he didn't take any questions. Uh, I can mm. tell you, on the other side of the camera, there are a few dozen reporters with some pretty pressing questions for Mike Johnson in terms of what happens in terms of spending, priorities, how fast they can move to avoid a government shutdown, and what is to be made of Ukraine money. Ukraine aid is in grave jeopardy in the U.S. Congress at this moment in time, especially in the U.S. House. Mike Johnson now has that in his lap, isn't taking questions tonight, and really didn't last night. He had a quick availability after winning the nomination, but it was marred by an episode in which his fellow Republicans shouted down and told a journalist to shut up when she asked about Johnson's vote to deny the 2020 election results. So he's not opening his speakership with an open door to questions about his priorities ahead. We'll see how long that is sustainable. But for now, he is cloaked, surrounded by his Republican colleagues and walking back to the floor for a non-controversial bill the entire Congress has been itching to pass, the bill that would condemn the attack on Israel.